Good morning. Uh, I'm greeting you from St. Matthew's, and uh, I'm happy that you're here to worship with us. I was speaking to some fellow clergy this week, and we were talking about how strange it is to be feeling so vulnerable uh, as you are watching me possibly in your pajamas with a cup of coffee and a bowl of cereal, and I think that that's fantastic, right? For most of our lives, the clergy come in in a giant parade down the aisle, and we're dressed in finery and well illuminated, and if someone wants to check us out for the first time, they might arrive five minutes late and sneak in and hide in the back pew to investigate what's going on here at St. Matthew's. Well, now you have a front row seat, and you can uh, watch this service, participate in the service, sing the hymns, but you can do all of that in the privacy of your home. And, and I think there's something that's all right about that. So I, I welcome you if you are a longtime member of this parish. Welcome back to your worshiping home. If you're visiting us for the first time, I hope you enjoy this service and we'll return. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook. I think we might be able to get on Instagram. Uh, so I'll look into that. We're not on TikTok. I don't really know what it is, but we'll, maybe we'll try to get this service on there in some sort of condensed TikTok form. I will not do any dances. Okay, so the service begins uh, with our uh, pro processional hymn, hymn number 474. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill our hearts with peace and joy. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. 
Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you riches beyond imagination. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the first reading. A reading from the book of Acts. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and, and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead hear what the spirit is saying to the church bless our god you peoples Make the voice of his praise to be heard, who holds our souls in love and will not allow our feet to slip. For you, O oh God, have proved us. You have tried us just as silver is tried. You brought us into the snare. You laid heavy burdens upon our backs. You let enemies ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out into a place of refreshment. I will enter your house with burnt offerings and will pay you my vow which I promised with my lips and spoke with my mouth when I was in trouble. I will offer you sacrifices of fat beasts with the smoke of rams. I will give you oxen and goats. Come and listen, all you who fear God. And I will tell you what he has done for me. I called out to him with my mouth, and his praise was on my tongue. If I had found evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth God has heard me. He has 
has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not rejected my prayer, nor withheld his love from me. A reading from the first book of Peter. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous of the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I now invite you to sing with me the gradual hymn, hymn number 569, Come My Way, My Truth, My Life. Thank you. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is written in the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning at a certain verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you love me, 
you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, there are certain things that I get to do when I am preaching in this space and in this time. Um, and uh, I was excited when I was preparing this sermon to be using this giant book that I use from time to time, and I'm going to show it to you because it makes me so happy. This is a ginormous Greek-English lexicon, and it is fantastic. I asked for it for my birthday many years ago, and I got it, and it mostly sits very still, but sometimes it is used, and I used it this, this week. What's wonderful about this lexicon, so basically it's a, it's, a, it's a dictionary, it's a Greek-English dictionary, but the Greek is ancient Greek, the kind of Greek that was used in the time of Jesus, the kind of Greek that the entire New Testament is written in. But what makes this special and why it's so ginormous is because it includes uh, in its analysis of the Greek, not just the words from the Bible themselves, but all of the ancient Greek that was used in that time, from every source. So when the Gospel writers choose to use a really interesting word, when I use this lex lexicon, it allows me to understand how that, would have, how that word would have been heard for the first time. If you're living in that time period, how, would this how will this word be heard? Because when we're looking at these kinds of lexicons and looking at these kinds of words, there's 2,000 years of Christians reflecting on that word when we ourselves are reading it. But when John was writing his gospel, he was writing to a group of people that had possibly never read any of the gospels or even heard of Jesus. So when he uses certain words, they're heard for the very first time. And so this is a really fun lexicon to use. So why I was using it was because of that word, advocate, I think that the word that I used in our translation was uh, Jesus was talking about, I'm going to get it here, um, I will give you another advocate. That was the word that Jesus used, advocate. And that's, of course, the Greek word is something else. The Greek word is parakletos, where we sometimes translate it as paraclete. That's the anglicized version of the Greek word, paraclete. And that translation of advocate is the, it was, became a very, very common translation for many, many years. And it suits a very certain understanding of who God is. If, for example, your understanding of God is of a great and powerful judge. Where was I? Right, advocate. So if you have an understanding of God as a powerful judge that is looking upon the world with uh, disdain perhaps or gloomy judgment then your understanding of christ and the holy spirit or the advocate is that we're going to need someone to intercede for us someone to be our advocate in a sense almost our lawyer right like our defense attorney and that that force will speak to god on our behalf and protect us so even though God wants to judge us, we have this helpful advocate here to protect us. But the reason why I got this giant 
lexicon is because while that became very much a part of Christian life for many, many centuries, that's not really the language uh, that people would have understood in the time of Jesus. A better translation might be helper or intercessor or mediator. If you break apart that word, uh, para, para klatos, uh, to, klatos means to call somebody, and para means beside. So if somebody's called you, the, this is someone that would stand beside you when you're called. If God's calling you, uh, you have a presence that is, that is with you. So the way that I interpret this word is less of a defense attorney protecting me from a wrathful God, but rather as a presence that is always with me, that is able to help me pray to a God that in some ways I cannot ever possibly comprehend. God, the creator of the universe, creator of all that is, that is infinitely unknowable. How could I, just little me, ever pray to a God that is so great? Right? One of the great things that Jesus provides us through his life, through the ways that he talks about God, is this way that we can become not only knowledgeable about God, but friends with God. And Jesus goes a step further to say, in addition to all of the ways that I have taught you, you will have within you this mediator, this helper that is, that is in your heart. And when you want to pray to God, you can do that. Even if I'm not here, there's a way that you can continue to love God and be with God. It's amazing, right? It's an amazing thing for, for Jesus to say and for us to pray and to believe that in our hearts is this almost intuition toward God. Of course, that stressed out powerful people, right? It continues to sort of stress out powerful people. Think about all the great religious leaders. If, if someone can just go off and pray by themselves, then, then what's the point of me standing here in a fancy outfit if you can be in relationship with God in your living room right now? The first thing I have to say is, I, I truly believe that what Jesus was trying to communicate to the world is that, is that we all have an opportunity to be, uh, to have an intuition towards God, to be in relationship with God. And honestly, I believe as a priest that if someone's visiting the church for the very first time, there is an immediate, there is a relationship that has been going on between that person and, and God and the sacred since they were born, regardless of where they came in to, uh, to church or not. But, what's, but what happens with our experience of the church with Jesus is that Jesus go on, goes on to say that if you, you let's say we all have, we all have this relationship with God, we all have this relationship with the sacred, but there are further questions that we can ask. What does that mean? Who is this God that I have a relationship with? I'm thinking about my uh, almost seven-month-old son. In some ways, all that we need right now is to just uh, have love for each other, right? He doesn't speak English, as far as I know. Uh, he communicates in babbles, and he is super, super cute, and I love him to bits. And right now, all that we need is this relationship. And that will always be, no matter, no matter what happens. He and I will have that relationship. But at some point, I'm going to have to talk to him about the world and being a person and all the stuff that goes on. And how do I make choices? And how do I live my life? And what are all the things that I'm going to need to do? And how come these bad things are happening to these good people? How come these good things are happening to these bad people? How do I live? What are, what do, who do I, you know, what are, what are the, you know, what are the stories that I need to be told? And that's what happens in church. We have surrounded ourselves with the stories of Jesus, the symbols that represent Jesus and God and the sacred, and the sacraments. And sacraments are incredible, right? They're this incredible combination of uh, an incarnate story that's made real in our presence, that we physically participate in, and there's something magical that happens when we are together and the bread and the wine become the body and the blood of Christ. There's something amazing about that. So we have these three powerful, powerful things that we have in church. We have all the stories of Jesus. 
We have all the symbols that represent the divine, and we have the sacraments. And through those, those things, through the church, through, ideally, through me, as in some sense the keeper of some of these stories, the, the person that owns this giant lexicon, right? We can start to unravel what it means to be in, in, in relationship with God. What does it mean to have this love affair with the divine? What do I do with that? How do I live my life? Where do I go with this? How can I understand this? Tell me some stories about the sacred so that I can, I can learn about what it means to have this love affair that I have. So I feel like that's what's happening in, in John's gospel, is there are sort of two things that are happening at the same time, because you see it all the time through this gospel. Jesus is saying, I am the way. Jesus, I am the way and the truth and the life. And Jesus is also describing this incredible relationship that people have with God that, that isn't intermediated uh, through any authority figure. And I believe that that's what's happening. You have a relationship with God right now. And that has nothing to do with me. You already have it. Where the church comes in is there are stories and symbols and sacraments that can help you and I to uh, nourish that relationship, to understand that relationship, to help, help us understand how does that relationship inform our life and, uh, and our decisions and all of the things that make us human. And that's where the church comes in. And we're going to talk about Jesus, because the way that Jesus lived his life is is the signpost, even though there have been thousands and millions of Christians over the, the two millennia that continue to inspire us. There are people today that we're going to point to and say, that person is embodying the divine and the sacred in some special way. Let's highlight their life and the choices that they're making. And all of this goes back to the way Jesus lived his life. So I, John's gospel is really, it's really remarkable, and the things that he's saying are very, very revolutionary and incredibly exciting. And to be honest, in this time, this COVID-19 time, there, these, the, the things that Jesus was teaching to these people 2,000 years ago apply to us in some new ways that we've never really had to wrestle with before. If you are in relationship with God and the sacred right now in your, in your living room, or I don't know if you're, maybe someone's watching this service in their car, I don't know. Um, you know, what, what is the role of the church in this time? How do we connect ourselves together through the symbols and sacraments and stories of the church? Is there a way that we can, we can observe sacramental life at home? What would that look like? That'll immediately get me into hot water with the new bishop, having too many of those questions. But uh, I, uh, I wonder, I wonder about what it means in this time. Those are some of the things I think me and many clergy are, are talking about, is what is the life of the sacraments in this time when we can't gather together, even though we desperately want to? So there's some new questions, and we're just getting started asking those questions, and unfortunately, I feel like we have a long time to, to wrestle with those questions in this time. Um, but the, the, the main thing that I want to leave with you is this, is this combination of, on one hand, you have a relationship with the divine and the sacred that Jesus has taught all of us and shown all of us by calling God Father. You are in relationship with God right now. And we are also the keeper of the stories of Jesus and the symbols and the sacraments and uh, we have a huge responsibility as the church to, to embody and to teach what it means to be uh, in relationship, to be in, in, in love with God. What does that mean for us and for our world? And I'm excited to, to share that with you. Let us now confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for all those who are alone, for this community, our country, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For John, our bishop. For Shane, our bishop-elect. For all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For our own special needs at this time. In our Anglican cycle of prayer this week, we pray for the Anglican Church of Korea. In our diocese, we give thanks and pray for all those who are affected by this COVID-19 pandemic, those who are uh, sick, those who are in the healthcare field. We pray for St. Bede's Nolan's Corners. We pray this week for all custodial staff serving within parishes and ministries at the Diocese of Ottawa. We pray for vocations to the diaconate, the priesthood and religious life. This week I invite you to pray for the parents of, uh, that are teaching and working. We pray for all those who might be increasingly overwhelmed by the obligations that this time are placing upon each of us. We pray for those who are in need and those who are ill, We're praying especially for Jean, Becky, Pat, Robin, Mary, Robert, Mark, Lucas, Callum, Lelia, Grace. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We pray for all those who have died in the peace of Christ, and for those whose faith is known to you alone, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them and put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Okay, I invite you to sing our final hymn. It's hymn number 527, How Firm a Foundation. service has ended, but your service has just begun. Go into the world to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Before uh, we begin the postlude, I'm going to do some announcements, very brief. I just want to remind you uh, the Zoom office hours that I'm holding on Wednesdays at noon. If Zoom is not your thing, you can also just give me a call uh, at, that, at that time as well. Um, and I think my phone number there is, you can call me, I, uh, I think I have, af there's the after hours pastoral emergency number. Well, that is waived, that emergency uh, uh, rider there for, uh, for, for my office hours. So feel free to give me a call. Um, other, uh, of course you have, ideally you, you're looking at your bulletin and there's a lot of things there. Is there any other? I'm looking now. No. Okay. So that, uh, that is all the announcements. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. 